first of all, I go into work, go into the internship, I should say. I go in there and it was pretty typical that I went in and they would pair me with one of the reporters and I would kind of follow them, shadow them, help them out if needed, but basically just kind of see how it was done in the real world. And like two weeks in, the assignment editor handed me my assignment and he goes, well, here you go. This is this is the story of the day. And I said, oh, cool. Like, which reporter am I going out with? He goes, oh, you're going out with Terry, but this is your story. You're going to be on the six o'clock news tonight. And I'm like, oh, oh I was not ready for this. It wasn't like, I think there's, you know, other internships where like the very last day, they finally kind of give you something like a little pat on the back. Like, here you go. We did this special thing for you. No, this was two weeks in. They kind of wanted to see what I was made of. And I was so nervous. You're listening to the Real Business Connections Network. Real Business Connections Network. Powered, powered, powered by Balbert Marketing, LLC. Subscribe now and check us out at realbusinessconnections.com. Enjoy the show. Welcome everyone to Learn, Speak, Teach, powered by Balbert Marketing, LLC. If you love to learn, be inspired, and succeed, we're here to speak and teach. I'm your host, Ben Albert. I believe if you're not living, you're dying. If you're not growing, you're withering. And if you're not engaged, we can turn this off right now. Because we here at LST are lifelong learners. And listen, I'm not your guru. I'm an ordinary guy on a journey to learn from the experts. My goal is to host each conversation with a beginner's mindset. Learn and let the experts speak and teach their truths. Join us. Oh yeah, and don't forget to subscribe. This episode is brought to you completely free. Get some stake in the game here. My fee for the show only takes a few moments. If you gain value from the episode, personally share with a friend and explain your favorite part. Bonus points. Please leave us a review on Apple, Google Podcasts, or anywhere you listen to the show. All right, let's get started. I am here today with Chris Van Vliet. Wow. I've never done that before. I don't know how it came out, but... Wow. That's it, that, that's definitely a first for me as well. I, I knew you're a wrestling fan, so I thought I'd try something different. I'm hoping that I didn't just destroy everybody's eardrums and, and they listen because it's going to be an incredible conversation today. Yeah, Ben, thank you so much for having me on. Hey, I'm, I'm excited. I'll start with the bio so people can get contacts, but a quick Chris Van Vliet. Plenty of information will come up on this gentleman here today. He is a four-time Emmy Award winning, we're not talking about nominations, four-time Emmy Award winning TV host, entertainment reporter, and YouTuber, approximately 113 million views, 323,000 subscribers on YouTube. So again, Chris Van Vliet on YouTube. Based in LA, he has traveled the world reporting on events like Oscars, Grammys, and the Canes Film Festival. What the, am I reading today? Oh my God. He's a big wrestling fan. Has interviewed John Cena, The Rock, Hulk Hogan. In addition to Hollywood A-listers like Oprah, Tom Cruise, and Will Smith. Podcast, um, his podcast is Insight with Chris Van Leet. It's top 0.1% globally. I'm top 2.5, so he's got me beat by a lot. And he's interviewed everyone from Jamie Foxx to Adam Sandler, a couple of my favorites. Ed Milet and Vanessa Van Edwards, many, many more. Chris, I feel like you should just host the conversation today. Right? <laughs> I don't know what else there is to say. So thank you so much for having me. And uh, we'll talk next time. So people can Google you. They can watch the highlight reel that's in the show notes. But I, I don't want to talk about those things that they can easily find. I want to do something different today. Can we start with pain? Can we lead with pain today? Mm. Because I just read a, an incredible amount of accomplishments. You tell me you didn't roll out of bed one day with the perfect smile, the perfect questions, and became a four-time Emmy Award winner. I am going to presume you had a few nosebleeds. So um, 
What are some of those nosebleeds? What were some of the struggles you went through to get to where you are today? I'd say the biggest one that sticks out is, look, I was super passionate about broadcasting. I always had the dream of working in television or radio, but I had zero connections to make this happen. I didn't have anybody who was a cousin or uncle or neighbor going, oh, you know, we can get you an internship. So I think that was a big pain point for me early on is I had to figure all of this out on my own and figure out a path to get there. And for me, it began in college. I had this realization, this epiphany when I was in my senior year. So to back it up a little bit, I studied communication studies just outside of Toronto. I'm from Pickering, Ontario. I went to school in Waterloo, Ontario. I was studying communication studies, but in my senior year, I had this moment where I went, oh man, after we graduate, we have to go work for you know the rest of our lives. And I realized at that point that I didn't want to be one of those people who had a job that I didn't enjoy going to. I didn't want to not like Sunday because Monday was the next day. So for me, it was like reaching out to all these places, sending cold emails, cold phone calls saying like, I'm a communication studies major. Can I just come in, volunteer, see how it's done in the real world? And that like jamming my foot in the door to make the door kind of ajar <laughs> was I think a really big, Thing early on because I wasn't really given any opportunities. I had to create these for myself. And if we fast forward a few years, I think the biggest pain point career-wise for me was like two years into my career, I had at the time, what was a dream job? I was hosting a show on MTV2 Canada. And I was like interviewing all kinds of celebrities, uh, actors and athletes and comedians and directors and some wrestlers as well. And our show after me being on it for a year ended up getting canceled when one big media conglomerate bought another one and they merged together. And it was like in an instant, like I was at work that day, typing away on my computer. My boss came in and said, everybody stop what you're doing. The show just got canceled. And like, mm. it felt like in an instant, the rug was just like pulled out from underneath me. And I had to figure out like, well, what do I do now? because I had picked up my entire life, moved it to the other coast, moved it 3000 miles away to Vancouver where that show was based. And that was a big one for me because I, I felt like I was living my purpose. And like I said, like a dream job at the time and really had to recalibrate and reevaluate what was important and kind of figure things out from there. But I'm a really big believer, Ben, that like things happen for a reason. And if it wasn't for that, it wouldn't have led me to where I was because it was being unemployed for seven months at that mm -hmm. point that led me to go, you know what? I think I'm going to try to get an agent in the United States and try to look for jobs there and uh, see what I can do. And that, you know, that's kind of led me to where I am now. It's a big rejection. It's a, it's a big pain to have to ease into what, what did it? What did it feel like? Not only did what did it feel like, what was your first move? I know personally in the past, I, I'll hit the bottle and I've had to learn not to ease and actually, you know, embrace some of the pain to avoid some of the suffering and struggle that I'm going to go through long term. How did you feel and what did you do to, you know, kickstart ultimately a whole new journey? The move was actually, it was a physical move because I had been there for almost a year. I, I think I was like, just like 11 months. Uh, like I was there for 11 months. So I needed to decide, do I renew the lease on my apartment now? Or do I pack my car up, drive 47 hours back to Toronto, move back mm -hmm. in with my parents and figure it out? It was a big decision. So the move was figuring out like, I think I had three days before I had to renew my lease. So the move was like, all right, like weighing all of my options, trying to figure this out. And I ended up deciding to move back home and kind of felt like I was kind of starting from scratch again. And I, I would say that, I mean, that was a while ago. That was 2007 when that happened. But one of the biggest things was deciding when I got back that this wasn't a, a vacation. This was like my job now became, I got to go find another job. And it sucked. It sucked because things were going so well. And I had the momentum of like doing this day in and day out. And then one day, boom, it's, it's all gone. So my new job became, I got to go find a job and try to find one that, that juiced me as much as that other one did. 
let's talk about that new job because a lot of people are going through career transitions. A lot of people want to start as an entrepreneur. They want to find their place. But you sound like you got a lot of practice way back. Well, well let's talk way back when, and then I want to talk more recent um, because I want to hear what you did to ultimately find that new job, that new career. But I want to go way back to the beginner level stuff. When you were first looking to make a career in communications, first, why did you choose communications? And then I want to talk about what some of that outreach looked like. What would you say? What would you do? Who you would re who? Would, let, let's start with why you chose communications. Always like really passionate about broadcasting and about TV and radio. And like, I was the kid who wanted to be in the plays and I hosted the talent show in high school. I did the morning announcements and I, I was so lucky, so fortunate mm. that I went to a school that had a communication studies program in high school. And we actually like played around with cameras. We had a little TV studio inside our school. And I think that that really helped to put some fuel on that fire that I already had. That, like I had little embers that were burning <laughs> But this really put some fuel on the fire and I went, oh, wow, like this is the thing I could study in school and maybe hopefully one day turn this into a career. So I think the first steps, this outreach that you're talking about was really just like you know, swinging for the fences and knowing that if you don't ask, the answer is always no. So when I graduated from college and was looking to find an internship, which would hopefully maybe turn into a job, I reached out to anybody who I could find an email for. And I didn't really hear back from anybody. And mm. I found this small station about an hour away from my hometown, pretty small station where you, you've you got to wear a lot of hats there. And I scoured the internet. I found the email address for the general manager. And I sent him an email and I said, hey, I'm going to be in town in the next few weeks. It's my spring break, but I'd love to come by and talk to you about a possible internship. And he wrote me back and said, well, we don't usually do this, but since you're going to be in town, sure, come on by. And you know, I had no plans to be in this town. I kind of lied my way in. And he looked at my resume. I had a little bit of volunteer experience. He said, sure, you know, we'll give you a, an internship and what the heck, see what happens. <laughs> Why not? I was working my old high school job at the mall in the mm -hmm. fish, uh, the fish department of a pet store to pay for the gas for my internship. And that was kind of how I really got the ball rolling. And a few months into it, well, actually a few weeks into it at first, that was how I got my start. Like two weeks in, they put me on TV. Like I was like an intern reporter. And then that was my internship from that point on. And then a few months in, they said, you know what? You're not an intern anymore. You've been doing such a great job. We don't have a job opening, but we created one for you. So, wow. you know, congrats, you're, you're now working here. And that was the best experience because I was shooting, writing, editing, producing, and reporting on all the stories I was doing there. So I was wearing multiple hats and wearing multiple hats at the same time. Shooting, writing, editing, producing, learning all of it. Let, let's slow down. So they, they put you on air, lights, camera, action. What happens? Oh, well, I, first of all, I go into work, go into the internship, I should say. I go in there and... It was pretty typical that I went in and they would pair me with one of the reporters and I would kind of follow them, shadow them, help them out if needed, but basically just kind of see how it was done in the real world. And like two weeks in, the assignment editor handed me my assignment and he goes, well, here you go. This is, this is the story of the day. And I said, oh, cool. Like, which reporter am I going out with? He goes, oh, you're going out with Terry, but this is your story. You're going to be on the six o'clock news tonight. And I'm like, Oh, oh. <laughs> I was not ready for this. It wasn't like, I think there's, you know, other internships where like the very last day, they finally kind of give you something like a little pat on the back. Like, here you go. We <laughs> did this special thing for you. No, this was two weeks in. They kind of wanted to see what I was made of. And I was so nervous. And I think one of the really big things, and this was 2005 when this was happening, we didn't have smartphones in our pocket. Like if you wanted to record a video, you either had a digital camera, which were they were relatively new at the time, or you had a camcorder. And it wasn't like you just took your phone out, hit record and did it. So like, I think a really big thing, at least at that time, was getting used to seeing yourself and hearing yourself on camera. And that was a big one for me. Like, how do you, how do you make yourself sound excited about the thing you're talking about, but still make it sound conversational and natural? Mm. It was... 
it was quite a uh, quite a journey of figuring that part out. What would you give a uh, scale from one to one hundred? What would you score your skill set at the time? Oh, uh, so I was I think I was a really good like learner. I was I was very teachable. But if I watch it back now, I, I don't know, like a four out of 100, like <laughs> actually, no, I'd give it like a, maybe a 10 out of 100. Like you could definitely see that there was something there, but I think I also looked like I was super nervous. There's something about setting up a camera and speaking with a crowd of people that are kind of walking around you and trying to make it sound like you're just having a natural conversation about the high school track and field meet. That was my first story. Okay. High school track and field meet. Love it. So you're you're a 10 out of 100. I'll give you a 14 because I like you. So wow. You're 14 so we added out of the 100. two terrible scores together. <laughs> when did you start to feel like you were leveling up? When did you feel like, wow, this actually might be my purpose in life? Was there a moment or obviously some succession of events? I will say, I felt like this was my purpose even before that moment. Like mm. I was so excited to be there and learn the ins and outs of everything. I was asking so many questions and I think that that, that really helped. Like I was asking questions about, we were still shooting on tape at the time. I was asking about like the DVC, DVC Pro, like tapes we were using and the editing system. But I, it wasn't until at least six months in that I felt comfortable. And I was watching stuff back and going, oh, yeah, yeah, that's if I didn't know me, didn't know that person, <laughs> yeah, I'd believe what that person's saying, yeah. which, you know, I feel like negates the six months of work up to that point. But it was I felt like every day I was leveling up, even if it was just, you know, a point one out of 100 you know, rating, mm -hmm. I felt like I was getting a little bit better every time. And I would watch it back and I would do like. They, they call them in news standups. That's the thing you see on the news where they, you know, the reporter standing there with the microphone, I'm using a pen here, but picture this as a microphone and they're, they're kind of setting the stage and like they're saying something, it's usually one or two sentences. I would record the standup like five or 10 times saying the exact same thing. And then I would watch it back in the editing room and go, ooh, yeah, well, that one's not good. Maybe the next one's better. Nope, that one still wasn't good. Maybe the next one's better. And I would just hopefully, you know, pick the the best of the mm -hmm. the least worst taste take, I guess. The the sixteen out of a hundred take. Yeah, it may be more like the fourteen point one out of a hundred. <laughs> well, I like how you had mentioned, you know, point one better. I was doing the math the other day. Um, Fifteen minutes is one percent of your day. It's actually mm. technically fourteen point four minutes. So you can take 14.4 minutes a day and make it 1% upgrade every single That's day. Good. If you I'm just gonna take that, that time. Right now. What what were your 14.4 minutes? What were, you know, one, two, or three tactics or strategies you were implementing to sharpen your saw and get that, you know, just a point better? A lot of it was it was uncomfortable too. And I, I would recommend this for anybody who's doing anything that's on camera, whether it's uh, a lot of Zoom meetings or presentations or even presentations in front of people, watching yourself back, you've got to do it. And one of the biggest things is you will realize that, yeah, you do that weird thing with your eyebrows when you talk and maybe one side of your mouth goes up a little bit <laughs> higher than the other when you smile. And yes, that is what your voice sounds like when you speak. I know it doesn't sound like that to you, but yes, that is what it sounds like. So getting comfortable with, meeting the digital version of yourself, if you will, that was a really big part of it. And then realizing, okay, once you're comfortable, and that takes a long time, once you're comfortable with that, then honing in on the skills of going, well, I did a lot of this last time. I said a lot of, um, uh, you know, or I waved my hands in a weird way, like starting to be aware of that and then, you know, cutting those out. That was a really big thing for me. And then also looking at people who I thought were just crushing it and maybe just kind of borrowing something from their skill set and bringing it into my own and making it my own. I think that was a really big thing. Like Tony Robbins always says, success leaves clues. And I think that, you know, don't become a carbon copy of someone else. Mm -hmm. But if you could take 
fun little thing that they do and, and bring it into your toolkit. And then you take one thing from somebody else and bring that into your toolkit and you do that a dozen times, you have a pretty great set of tools. You do, you do. And it never gets easy. I say it doesn't get easier, but you get better because mm, of those good. set of tools. One thing I've done, a tool I have is I, I've got a mixer here, so I sound slightly less bad um, in terms of my voice here. But um, who were some of those people that you maybe at the time, or you can shout out people now, who do you learn from? You had mentioned Tony Robbins, obviously prolific man. Who else were, who else were you learning these things from? I remember taping a show on the new TNN before it was Spike TV <laughs> called The Ultimate Revenge because this is when I was still in, in college because there was a host on there that was so engaging and so charismatic. And it felt like he just kind of leapt through the screen when he spoke. And his name was Ryan Seacrest. And then about oh. a year later, <laughs> he went on to host American Idol and obviously you know, became a household name. But I remember taping those shows because I went, man, he just has something there that makes me want to listen to him. So he was a big one early on. I also very early on, loved watching Joe Rogan on Fear Factor, mm. you know, well before he became the Joe Rogan that we know now, he just had this conversational way of speaking to the camera because there's a lot of people, especially in news, that get in front of the camera and you know, they sound like they sound very newsy, like tonight in the news, this is what's happening. And like, I just thought like nobody talks like that. Right. And I love the way that he spoke to the camera like it was his friend. And I think when you... Yeah, I've done a lot of interviews in my career. And I think when you think of great interviewers, it's Oprah, it's Larry King, it's Howard mm -hmm. Stern. And there's also one in Canada. For anybody listening in Canada will know the name George Strombolopoulos. And I always loved their inquisitive mind. And like, I, I just love the way that they asked questions that maybe wouldn't immediately pop to mind. And then they would always try to dig one layer deeper. If you could compare yourself to any one of those or non-mentioned interviewers, who do you inspire to be like? What is your style? I mean, I, I certainly, I aspire to be a better version of myself with every time I hit record or every time I have a new conversation. Like that's the big thing for me because I, I know I'll never be like any of those other people that I just listed. And yeah, you know, quite frankly, I don't want to because they are who they are and that's what makes them so great. But I love that now these long form style of conversations are now the norm because they weren't for so long. And that was what made Howard Stern so, so good because he would talk to someone for 45 minutes or an hour. And, you know, we now call that a podcast. But back then that didn't really happen. And I love the way that, he would slowly peel back the layers of the onion and mm. he would loosen them up and we would hear stories from them that they hadn't told before. Maybe they hadn't felt comfortable telling before. But again, this is like a, such a Canadian reference, but George Trombolopoulos was a VJ on Much Music, which is basically like the Canadian version of MTV. And he just had this really conversational way of connecting with people and building rapport with people. And I, I always found that so fascinating. And that was something that I always really tried to do. I tried to build rapport with people so that when you do ask a question, that's maybe a little bit more difficult to answer, they would feel more comfortable opening up to you. And you're very good at that, Chris. I'll be a, a testimonial for you. Your podcast, Insight with Chris Van Vliet, you're very good at, at that conversational interview. And I feel like you're an advocate for everyone. I saw on your highlight reel, I forget who it was. She's asking you to take your shirt off. You're unbuttoning a couple buttons. I'm like, this guy is down for whatever the moment brings. For that, I just think it's like, so that was Leslie Mann and Dakota Johnson. It was Got it. with it. Okay. Went viral uh, <laughs> a handful of years ago. And I think for me, I just want to swing for the fences, especially in those celebrity interviews. Like, when someone's promoting a movie, like recently I was in Dallas interviewing Dave Franco and Jamie Foxx, like you mentioned, you get like five minutes with them and they're mm. answering a lot of the same questions and they're doing 40 or 50 interviews in a day. And I learned that like, if you ask better questions, you get better answers. And I've always been trying to look for those moments, whether it's in a long form interview or a short red carpet interview or a junket style interview, trying to create those moments that 
have never happened before. So I figure if you swing for the fences and it doesn't work out, you just edit it out. But if it does work out, my goodness, you get an amazing moment. Like I rapped Miami, the song Miami with Will Smith in Miami mm. or Gerard Butler was promoting a London has fallen and he, you know, he's a total badass in the movie. And I was talking to him about a movie punch and he's like, Oh yeah, well sit up in your chair. And then he like movie punches me. And <laughs> it was so cool. And we added the, you know, punching sound effect. It looked amazing. But those are the things that like, if you don't ask, the answer is going to be no, kind of like what we were talking about earlier. So why not at least ask? And we're going to circle back to um, that moment. We're going to fast forward in a second. But first, while we're on it, um, you had mentioned you ask better questions, you get better answers. Um, I wrote this down, so I'm going to use my cheat sheet here. But you spoke at Justin Shank's Growth Now Summit. Um, and a big quote I wrote down in bold is, everything you have and don't have in your life is based on the questions that you ask. Mm. Everything yeah, you have and don't have in your either. life is based on the questions that you ask. Elaborate on that for us. I mean, think about it. Think about it. Like, so everything in your life is a result of the conversations you have, have either had or have not had. And I think that if you don't ask, the answer is always going to be no. And I think that if you take a snapshot of your life, a lot of them are the questions you've either asked of other people. If you're thinking of things like, buying a car or a, a job that you either have or don't have. But if, you can also think about this in your life of like, what are the, what's the path that you're on? And I'm really fascinated by the idea that when we're kids, we are all asked the same question. And you know, the one I'm thinking about, what do you want to be when, when you, grow, you grow, up? grow up? Right. And then you grow up. I'll put that in quotes because <laughs> I don't know, we're still figuring this out, right? None of us have really mm -hmm. grown up, mm -hmm. but it really shifts to what do you want to be to now what do you do and you become defined in a lot of aspects of your life based on the thing that you do and for so many people they don't even enjoy that thing and the question i think a lot of people need to be asking themselves is whose path are you on if you're not on the path that you originally wanted to be on and at what point did you start living someone else's path and following someone else's path and living someone else's life and I think that those are really important questions. I'm not saying that everybody's going to have the dream job that they're jacked to go to every single day, but there needs to be some sort of balance between, you know, the vast majority of people who dread five days a week to live for the two days on the weekend. There needs to be some sort of balance there. And just start asking questions and the answers you start to attract the answers if you're asking the right questions. So this is not just um, to others. This is to myself as well, right? Oh, absolutely. And I think it begins, like for me, it begins every day with what am I grateful for today? And that's actually the question I ask at the end of every episode of my show. So, so I was going to ask you that. So spoiler alert, but we'll, we'll get to that at the end. <laughs> Go on. So, then, then the reason that I do that is, yeah. number one, I think it's so interesting to hear someone who's at the very top of their game, you know, a, a, an A-list actor or a Super Bowl winning uh, athlete or someone like that to hear they're grateful for the same things that you're grateful for. Oh my mm. God, that's mind blowing, right? It kind of uh, puts you on their level in a way. And I also think that people don't practice gratitude in their daily life. So they go, oh, wow, if that person can be grateful for things like their health or their family, I could be grateful for those things too. So I think that's a really good question to ask at the start of the day and at the end of the day too. It's a great question to ask. We we all put our pants on the same way. Maybe Weird Al. I feel like Weird Al yeah, Yankovic probably puts it on upside down with a handstand. But most of us are we're just ordinary people, right? Chris is just an ordinary dude with an ordinary life who just happens to be doing extraordinary things, and we appreciate that about you. And I think that it's I think that too often we see someone just at the end of their path, like so close to the finish line. And it's hard for us to envision that person, like, you know, the famous story of Michael Jordan getting cut from his high school basketball team. Like, mm -hmm. we can't even wrap our heads around that idea. And I think it's important to find someone who you really look up to, but then reverse engineer it all the way back to where you're at now. And it kind of humanizes that person in a way and makes them, makes you realize 
wow, if that person, Tom Brady, Oprah, whoever you want it to be, Tony Robbins can do that thing with the background that they have, man, I can do that too. And I hope we're doing some of that unraveling in this conversation. That's why I jokingly am like, here's how cool Chris is, but let's lead with pain today. I love it. I know it's not always easy. So you had hit the highest point of your career. You're working for MTV. You get let go. Was it similar to when you started just all this outreach? If you don't ask the answers, always no. What did you do at that time? Was it a similar structure? You obviously had a sharper saw by then. What what did that look like for you? I changed the home screen on my internet browser to be a job search website. That was number one. That was a mm, huge change that's for some me. some commitment right there. I like that. You changed your home screen to a job search website. So when I opened up probably wasn't Chrome at the time, it was Internet Explorer. That would be the first thing I would see. So like, if I wanted to click away to go to something else, I was kind of saying to myself like, oh, really? You're not even gonna take the five minutes to just even scroll around and look for new jobs. So that was a big thing. And I, I would use that tactic a lot. Like there was a sports radio station that I ended up um, volunteering at for a few weeks. I changed the homepage in the weeks leading up and then the weeks I was volunteering there. I changed the home screen to their website. So I would be seeing like what was in their world, what was important to them. And I think that that's a great tactic for anybody to employ. So that was step number one. And I mentioned earlier that I made it my job to look for a job. And I was mm. doing everything I could to try to just edge out whoever the next best person might be for that job. And I got myself down where it was me and one other person, me and two other people being considered for a hosting job. And it would go to the other person because maybe they had more experience or maybe they were a little bit more recognizable in Canada. I got so frustrated that I was like, man, if I can't get a job in my own country, if I can't get a job in Canada. I'm going to look elsewhere. I know there's so many more TV stations, so many more opportunities in the U S and that's when I started like spending my days Googling TV hosting agent. And mm -hmm. like, I started making a list of the people who, uh, the names that kept popping up. And I sent a cold email to this one agency in Los Angeles. And I said, I'm in LA pretty frequently. I was actually only in LA once in my life at that point in time. <laughs> and I, I said, what you did there. <laughs> I said, uh, next time I'm in town, it'd be great to come by. This was, this was like total playbook thing that I always did. <laughs> And sure enough, I got a phone call one day and they said, well, when's the next time you're in LA? I'm like, oh, I think it'd be, yeah, it's definitely in the next month, I think. And they said, all right, well, pick the day and let us know. And I ended up making an entire trip around that. I stayed in the cheapest motel in Hollywood that I could possibly stay in. I'm sure I was like shooing the cockroaches out as I was uh, walking in the door, but it ended up working out and that agency signed me and immediately started getting me meetings and auditions and that kind of got the ball rolling yeah. to finally be where I was at. But none of this would have happened without me having a clear goal in my mind of this is where I want to be. This is what I want to be doing. And then trying to figure out a way to get there. So you're a humble guy, but I want you to be prideful for this one. Why do you think they hired you? Why do you think they brought you on as a client? What what was special about you versus anybody that they could have hired on as a client? That's such a great question. I I think that I just had I had the momentum of being on MTV to Canada. I was a fresh face, which is a pretty important thing in Hollywood. And I think that it was it was low risk for them too, if I'm being completely honest. I think they they signed me and if I don't end up getting hired, I think they went, well, you know, on to the next one. But I think it was the idea that I was new, young. I'm guessing that they liked what they saw in my demo reel at the time. And they went, let's just see what happens here and go from there. And I am so, so grateful that they took a chance on me. What was the, so they take a chance. What was the big break and how difficult was it to get there? I know it's not always a yes, right? When you walk in the door. So what was that next big break and how'd you get there? It wasn't, I, I'll tell you a story about it. It wasn't a break, mm. but it was like, 
it was a very big audition. It was with TRL, which was still on at the time. Okay, I remember. And they were transitioning. Carson Daly had moved on. They had a new host there called Damian Fahey. He had just accepted a new role somewhere else and they were looking for someone to replace Damian Fahey. And I was like, oh my God, like TRL, like in Times Square. And I actually had an audition there in the TRL studio with MTV, that was such a big moment where I was like, even though I didn't end up getting that job because they ended up canceling the show instead, they didn't end up hiring a new person at all. But the fact that I was even in that conversation and it was down to me and one other guy, wow. that, that gave me so much confidence to go, something's gonna happen here. Like something's gonna work out. And I think that that was the really big one that made me kind of start to look at things through a different lens. So you're looking at it in a different lens. You've always been passionate. You, you're you convicted in what you're doing. You got lucky in a sense that you're working in industry, which is in direct alignment with your purpose in life. You start getting a little bit of momentum. When did you really gain speed? So that had fallen through. It never came to fruition. What happened next? Because obviously at some point you gained a tremendous amount of momentum. I So when I... The job I finally did get after being laid off or the, the show being canceled was in Toronto. Mm. And that started to gain a lot of momentum because I was doing like daily, weekly, like big celebrity interviews. And I was able to put together a pretty great, they call it in the industry, a demo reel. Mm. My agent was like, there's an opening for an entertainment reporter for the CBS station in Cleveland. Would you be interested? And I was like, well, you know, I thought that it would be like Los Angeles or New York, but this sounds like a great opportunity. She goes, not only is it a great opportunity, but it's a chance for you to get a visa and work in the United States. And I said, yeah. I'd love to even audition. Of course, let's do it. And the moment that really shifted things was I went in for an audition there and the news director goes, you know what? I think we're going to put that on TV this afternoon in the newscast and just kind of see what people say and like, kind of let, let them be the barometer. And I went, Oh my gosh, like my <laughs> audition's going to be on TV. Wow. And I called my agent. She's like, I don't even think they can do that, but <laughs> Oh, well, I'm okay. And I think what really changed things was I recorded that. And then I went to the airport about an hour later to fly back home to Toronto and one of the TSA agents in the airport was like, didn't I just see you on TV? And I was like, oh my God, like <laughs> it, th that, that, that never happened in my entire career. And now that, that was like one time this audition that's on TV, that was what I think really changed it. And, you know, being on a, being on a, a big station in a big city like that, like really started to get the momentum going. And then one week into my job, I was reporting from the Oscars and it was just like one thing after another from there. And mm -hmm. then I started taking the raw interviews because, you know, with the way the television model was set up, unless you were watching channel 19 at exactly 4, 19 PM on that Tuesday, you wouldn't have ever seen these television moments or these interviews. So I started taking those raw interviews and putting them on a YouTube channel, just as kind of like a digital space for these to live in like a digital library. And when those interviews started really getting hundreds of thousands, some of them even millions of views, I went, okay, the landscape here is definitely changing. It's going from broadcasting, which is turn on the news and watch news, weather, sports, traffic, entertainment, to more of like what I like to call niche casting of like, mm. if you are a fan of, this particular movie or this particular actor, you can type that into YouTube and watch that specific video. And that's when I went, oh, things are definitely changing. And that, that gained a lot of momentum with the YouTube channel. Love it. Things were changing. You sounded like you were early to the YouTube game. Do you think a lot of your, I mean, what was the numbers? I, I don't have them pulled up anymore. Just millions, hundreds of millions of YouTube view, views today. Do you think part of it is because you went early to the game or you tell me? I think it's just been about like experimenting. So yes, mm. early to the game, a, a really big part was like, you know, we're talking 10 years ago when some of the big movies were like the Twilight movies, the Hunger Game movies, mm. some of the uh, Marvel or DC movies. 
not only early to the game with putting these on YouTube, but like early to the game of like getting them to YouTube first. <laughs> like yeah. there'd be times when I'd be like, oh my God, Henry Cavill just talked to me about putting the Superman suit on for the first time. Like this is big news. I would be like sitting there in the airport, like editing it and trying to get it <laughs> online first. So that was a really big part of it, but it shifted a lot recently. Like short form content now is like really where a lot of attention is. And I feel like it's really undervalued attention too. So I started a clips channel, a second mm. YouTube channel. I started it two years ago, but I really started putting time into it like towards the end of last year. So almost a year ago. And that channel is now already at 130,000 subscribers. And wow. actually the total views on there just surpassed my main channel, which wow. was mind blowing to me. So I think it was just kind of realizing, oh, YouTube shorts and vertical videos like Reels and TikToks are a thing. Okay. Well, what if I put some more attention towards that? What if I put some more time and effort towards that? And, you know, if it works, amazing. If it doesn't, all right, we'll just figure something else out. I love this. So getting to the game early helps, but you started a whole new channel with a different purpose and blew that channel up with these clips these reels these shorts what makes a good short is there a system how do you do you know if a short's going to win or do you just post out quantity like what is your strategy to go wildly viral with these shorts i would say find a title that is massively clickable like mm. find a title that and, and don't make it clickbait. Make it something that the video actually can deliver on the promise that the title has. For Literally it. all the clickbait was running through my head. Like Chris Van Vliet <laughs> right. takes off his shirt, <laughs> post this to YouTube. <laughs> I would think of it more in terms of like, this person explains something, this person reveals something mm. or how to insert, you know, whatever here. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really big thing. Like stop thinking of titles as titles and start thinking of them as headlines, like what makes you wanna click on an article and, and start to apply that towards your, your reels, your shorts, your TikToks, your short form clips. And I just started looking at like, Joe Rogan had a clips channel that was getting like way more views than his main channel. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of podcasts were doing that. Logan Paul did that with his impulsive clips channel. I went, if all of these massive podcasters are doing this, there's gotta be something there. And then I just started to think about it and the, like the fundamentals of it made sense. Joe Rogan's podcasts were two or three hours long. That is a huge investment of your time. Right. Especially if you're watching it on your phone, mm -hmm. like to ask someone, even just 45 minutes, let's say, to ask someone to watch something on their phone for 45 minutes and not go away from that app, to not go away from YouTube, that's a huge, huge ask. But if someone is doing just one thought and it's four minutes, six minutes, seven minutes, whatever it is, that's much more digestible. So as we just start to break things up into thoughts or stories and started to see like really, really big growth with that. That's incredible. What did Tony Robbins say again? He said, success leaves clues. So if the big shot podcasters are doing it, there's a high probability it could work for you as well. And not just in podcasting or in YouTube, but just in business in general. If mm -hmm. someone in your space is getting massive results or huge growth from doing something that maybe seems a little bit out of the ordinary, well, instead of just writing that off as like, oh, that's weird or that's new or that'll never work, maybe pay attention and go, oh, that's why they're spending X amount of dollars on whatever it is, Facebook ads, TikTok ads, or social media person, or whatever it happened, direct to mail, I don't know, whatever it is. Oh, maybe, maybe I should be doing even just a fraction of that. Mm. So I'm going to grab my pencil. I like to keep this conversational, but I'm going to be transparent. Ben has a couple questions because I want to get better as an interviewer. And I think everyone can benefit if they write these down. Chris, so what? makes a good question. You, you mm. only have one question for a big shot celebrity. How do you know what to ask them? What makes a great question that gets someone to stop and go, that's a good question it's and give always, you more time? Go it's on. always so difficult when it's just one question. <laughs> Definitely, you know, nothing that's going to have a yes or a no. 
I think that if you can tie it into you somehow and make it personal to you somehow, that always endears the other person to you. And I think that that makes it a little bit of a better question. But I think the bigger thing is just trying to go one layer deeper and also trying to spin it in a way that you're asking it in a way that's never been asked before. I've used this example a lot of times, but I think it's so pertinent because in celebrity interviews, you get a lot of the, what was it like working with so-and-so? What was it like working with Tom Cruise? What was it like being directed by Steven Spielberg? And the answer always happens to be something along the lines of like the cliche, oh, wow, they were so great to work with. They're such a hard worker and mm -hmm. it was such an honor. Like, you know, some version of that. Mm -hmm. So I started just taking it one layer deeper of like, what's the thing you learned from working with Steven Spielberg that you'll take with you to the next set that you're on. And oftentimes that opens it up to a great story that perhaps they've never told before. And if we're speaking strictly from like an entertainment reporting side, that's when you can get like a, a great sound bite or a great headline or a great news story because they're revealing something to you that they've never revealed to somebody before. And even going back to what we were talking about before of like seeing that journey along the way, there's a lot of times in movies where there's kind of that hero's journey of like, they start out in one spot and by the end of the movie, you know, they're in a different place. Mm -hmm. I always find it so interesting to be like, you know, you, you in your own life have followed that same type of journey. What was the role that changed your life or the script that changed your life? Or sometimes what was the no that you heard that changed your life and set you on a different trajectory? And I think that it allows us to, visualize that person then in a different way and see them in a different way. It does. So I'm wondering, cause you're, I'm sure you don't get pulled over. Do you get pulled over every you go on the street? I'm sure you get people recognize you these days, right? I mean, it happens from time to time, especially if we're at a wrestling show. It definitely okay. happens a lot more. So people come up to you and they ask you questions. What What's maybe a question that comes to mind that someone asked you or an energy they brought to the conversation that just felt icky or needy or not in the right place? And what did they do wrong? I think you're right when it, like it's, it's about energy, right? And it's mm. about intention. And I think that I've run into this a few times and Ben, I'm sure that this has happened to you as well, but like there's been times when people lead with like, especially in the entrepreneurial space of like, well, how can I help you? But what they really mean is like, if I do something for you, well, then you do something for me. And it feels very disingenuous. And I think that the most important thing is to just be authentic, like be authentic. If you're looking for something from someone, just ask instead of trying to present it in a way of like, how can I help you, you know, but really like, how can you help me? I like that. So I, I see in everyone listening, envision that superstar that you'd love to have a conversation with. So you see Dwayne The Rock Johnson, or for me, Vanessa Van Edwards, I definitely have a little boy crush on her. And I want to walk up and say something to this celebrity, to this person that that inspires me what should I do? How should I feel? Am I there? I can't just start doing push-ups. I'm going to look like a weirdo. I want to walk up and say something. What, what would Chris do in a scenario like that? I would say just be genuine, like be genuine to <laughs> what who does that you mean? Are. What does that mean? Be genuine. I think that there's a lot of times when people go up and they go, I just, I, I'm just, uh, I'm just such a, you know, a big fan. And, and like, that's, that's a great thing to say, but like, if you only have 20 seconds or 30 seconds or a minute with somebody, try to frame it in a way that that'll be a, a moment that maybe you can take something out of that and then apply it to your life. So like, mm. yeah, if you bump into someone at the grocery store, you probably don't have time to think this through, but if you're going to an event and that event has somebody that you really look up to, that's going to be there. And you know, there might be a chance that your paths might cross during the cocktail hour Think of if if I were to bump into whoever that might be, what would be something that I could ask them that could, you know, their insight might be something that I could apply to my own life. Mm. One weird question. 
Um, and then we'll go to rapid fire round and close out. So think of a superhero or a fictional character. Okay. So it's someone that you're never actually going to be able to interview because it's quite impossible. Because I, I believe that anyone you'd like to interview, you'll end up interviewing them. But this is fictional, so it's not possible. Who is that fictional character that you would just love to interview? And what would you ask them? What would your leading question be? I would love to pick Bruce Wayne's mind, like pick Bruce Wayne's brain, knowing that we know that he's Batman. <laughs> right. Cause I mean, talking to Bruce Wayne and you know, he's billionaire and he's eccentric and charismatic. That'd be one thing, but like talking to him, knowing that he's also Batman, I think would be like super, super interesting. And I, I don't know off the top of my head, I don't know what I would I don't know what I would ask him up, but I would just be so fascinated with like how that whole thing functions, like how, how him and Alfred are creating all these incredible gadgets and inventions. And I don't know. I, I would also ask him like, when do you sleep? Because it seems like Bruce Wayne works really hard throughout the day. And then Batman works really hard at night. <laughs> I would, I would love to know Bruce Wayne's morning routine. You know, I like this option because since people don't know he's Batman, you could probably just walk up, shake his hand and ask him how he's doing. You don't, he's kind of in disguise right now. So you can mm. kind of make friends with him. In that which regard. one, I mean, which one's the, the disguise though, right? I mean, is Batman the disguise or is Bruce Wayne the disguise? Because I feel like, especially with the new Batman movie, he definitely feels more himself when he's Batman. Mm. I got to find the mic. Chris, I wish I could hand you this mic so you could drop it right now, but I'll drop it for you. Rapid fire round, short, sweet, either or. We're just going to blow through these. Who's okay. line is it anyway? It's whose line is it anyway mixed with family feud, so it's quick and the points don't matter. Coffee or tea? I'm actually drinking tea. Well, it's a little cold because of our conversation here, but tea. I, I, I'm not a coffee drinker at all. Beer, wine, or fill in the blank? Between those two, it's definitely more wine. I've been drinking, I love beer, love beer, but I've been drinking a lot less beer because I don't know, like too many beers makes me feel like I ate an entire pizza. And <laughs> while I love beer, it's been a lot more red wine, Pinot Noir and tequila, like tequila with some soda water, a little splash of grapefruit. So it's like a very light Paloma. Nice and tasty. Are, are you a morning person? You kind of have yeah. to be, right? Yeah. And like, I've always been a morning person, but my fiance wakes up like really early. Like I, I love her for so many reasons and Rachel's amazing, but I love the, one of the biggest reasons is she finds time for fitness and the gym and wellness early in the day. Like she leaves her work at like 7am. So she's like, well, if I work out after work, I'm not going to have as much time. I maybe won't want to go straight from work to the gym. So she's like, well, I guess I got to work out before work, which means waking up at 4.45 to be at the gym with a time that begins at a five. So I'm like, well, if you're waking up at that time, like, who am I to be sleeping in then? So let's do it. We want to support you. I'm about to go leave a review for Insight Chris Van Vliet. I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to because your podcast is incredible. Other than the podcast and the channel, the YouTube channel and the Shorts channel, the two main ones, what is exciting you? What are you lo looking, uh, looking, looking forward to for the future? How can we support you as you go forward in this journey? Well, first of all, Ben, thank you so much for bringing me on here. What a great conversation. This was so much fun. I wish we had four more hours to chat. But I think the best way that people can connect is just on social media. It's at Chris Van Fleet, whether you're on TikTok, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, wherever it happens to be. And wherever you're listening to this, you can find my podcast Insight with Chris Van Fleet and go dive into some of the interviews I've done recently. Like Adam Sandler was on the show recently, Jamie Foxx, Chris Hemsworth, Melissa McCarthy. I just, right before this, I did an hour with Billy Corgan, the lead singer of Smashing Pumpkins, who's a fascinating individual. So it'd be awesome if you could go in there. And if you did like an episode and you had an extra 27 seconds in your day, maybe you could leave a review on Apple podcasts.
I recommend, guys, do it while you listen to the episode, Two Birds, One Stone. And listen, if this is the last ever episode of Real Business Connections you listen to because you go and binge on Chris, I will not lose any sleep over it because he's doing great things, great conversations with great people. Um, and I'm humbled to have the conversation with you today, Chris. It, it's been such a pleasure. Oh, the pleasure's mine. I super appreciate the, your time. And thank you for allowing me to hang out with you and your audience. Thanks, man. We'll talk soon. Thanks again for listening to Learn, Speak, Teach, powered by Balbert Marketing, LLC. You need to go subscribe if you haven't yet. This show is completely free. If you gain value from the episode, personally share with a friend and explain your favorite part. Leave us a review on Apple, Google Podcasts, or anywhere you listen to the show. All right. Thanks once more for listening to LST. I am so grateful. Talk to you soon.